I had heard through the grapevine that there was this young man who had directed Reservoir Dogs, and uh, I was intrigued by his fascination with me and why. So when I met with him, uh, he, he enlightened me about what I meant to him as a young boy growing up, uh, what <clears throat> Saturday Night Fever meant to him, what Grease meant to him, what um, Blowout meant to him, and uh, what um, Pauline Kael, the, the famous critic of the time, I was her, fortunately, her favorite actor, and she had quite a cachet in, in the critics at, at that time. Uh, and he followed critic, critics. And so his favorite critic, uh, his favorite actor was me, and his favorite actor was me, and he f kind of felt this kinship about isolating me as this, th this icon that needed uh, to have a very special career and a very unique uh, a talent. So um, he also was a fan of the first TV show I did called Welcome Back, Cotter. And he had collected games, like uh, board games, of each of my famous shows, you know, Cotter and Grease and Saturday Fever. And he had this fantasy that we would play games together of these shows. And um, I was so uh, touched by his uh, his uh, infatuation with with my my career, my uh, the, the 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 projects that were important to him at at the time, that I um I went with it, and you know we played board games and we caught up, and he told me about his life, and I told him about my life, and. Um, then he also told me of his disappointment in some of my career choices after the initial one, and I was kind of hurt my feelings at first, but when I contemplated on it, I said, you know, criticism by its nature is not valuable. Nattering is not valuable, but critique with an intention to support someone is valuable. There's a big difference. He's saying, I see what you are and what you can be and what you will be. And so we stayed up till five or six in the morning from about 11. So we had a good six, seven hours together. And right before the evening ended, which was the morning really, he said, you know, I have this project in mind that you, you would be really right for. And he went into depth about it, but it wasn't Pulp Fiction, it was um, Dusk Till Dawn. And then he told me a little bit about this other project called Pulp Fiction, but it was already cast with this uh, other actor, Michael um, Madison. And uh, and so he told me about both projects, uh, but clearly I had more enthusiasm for the Pulp Fiction project than I did the Dust Till Dawn. But he was tremendously um, puzzled by this, and he and he uh, he finally said to me, oh, but, but before you go, um, before you go, um, what 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 is it exactly that you are not responding to and to this? to the desk till dawn thing. I said, it, no, it's fine. He said, no, no, no. Well, what don't you like about it? I said, I'm just not into vampires. I said, I I'm sorry, I just, it ain't my thing, you know? And he went, oh, oh, okay. I said, but the other project I liked. He said, yeah, yeah, but that I, uh, but I got that. Uh, he said, okay, well, we'll find something one day together. I said, okay. I remember meeting Quentin when I auditioned for Reservoir Dogs. Uh, and I was supposed to read with uh, Tim Roth and somebody else because I was reading for the guy who does the thing with him on the roof with the dogs, and the story about the dogs in the bathroom. I didn't get that part. Um, and I read with uh, Lawrence and Quentin. I actually had no idea who they were, but I went to my audition, and I'm reading with these two guys, and I'm like... And I left the audition going, fuck, who the fuck was that? I'm, those guys sucked. I'm, I'm never gonna get that job, and I didn't. But then I went to Sundance, and I was there for the first screening of Reservoir Dogs, and I saw Quentin, and I went up to him to tell him how much I liked the movie, and, I was like, and he said, how'd you like the guy who got your part? So apparently he remembered who I was. I was like, well, you would've had a better movie with me in it, and I didn't realize you were the director when I was reading with you. He said, don't worry, I'm writing something for you. And I was like, you remember me? You're writing something for me? And he's like, sure, sure, sure. It's kind of a weird story, but I was taking Amanda Plummer, who I knew, um, to um, the Fisher King premiere. 
And, uh, <laughs> and I knew, I, I knew she'd be late. So I, uh, it was her premiere, it was her red carpet. So I, I said to the car to pick me up at my flat and then we'd go around and get her from a place around the corner. And uh, so I took her and she was asleep. As, so threw her in a dress, threw her in a car and then took her to the premiere and Quentin was there. Tim introduced me to Tarantino there and I liked him in less than a second. And he said he'd like to work with both of us, so I was over the moon. I said, I want to do a film with you, but with Amanda, but she has to have a really, really big gun in her hand. Because <laughs> the idea of Amanda with a gun in her hand is, is really quite scary. And so uh, he wrote that, he wrote those parts for me and her. I had met Quentin at Sundance. We both had films. He had Reservoir Dogs and I had The Water Dance. And we were sort of the films in competition. And I went to a screening of Dogs and that night I had the, just the strangest, weirdest dreams. And the next day I ran into Quentin at a screening and I told him, I said, dude, your film really messed up my mind. And he said, good, that's great. That's exactly what I wanted to, that's fantastic. And uh, then I think we all went to a party. And then I think the next year or two years later, I was walking down Broadway in New York City in the morning, because I remember that morning light. And I looked across the street and, and I sort of recognized Quentin has a very specific lope. He doesn't walk, he's sort of he's like an animal. It's like a jungle cat. And uh, there was some, something shiny on his hand and, and I got closer and he was wearing a Toxic Avenger ring that was probably as big as his no, it was just a massive ring. And uh, we started talking, he said, oh, I was just talking about you because I'm staying with a friend and my other friend has a script that he wants you to do. We were all just falling over each other with, hey, read this script, what do you think, read this, can you be in this, do you want to do that? It was a very fervent summer. I remember sitting at Swingers in Hollywood with him at the, at the um, you know, the bar, bar. <laughs> um, and, uh, and talking to him uh, and, you know, he's just a, an encyclopedia of, of information about anything to do with film or television or anything that it was ever shot ever in all of humanity. <laughs> Six months later, I get a call saying, Quentin Tarantino has rewritten this Pulp Fiction with you in mind now. He's off the Michael Madsen idea and he thinks that after spending the night talking to you, that you were this, um, you had this analytical part of your personality that he had not been aware of. And he wants this hitman to have this philosophical, orderly thinking. I said, great, let me read it. I was doing this film in Lexington, Virginia, and I got this plain brown wrapper with, um, I guess Danny's company logo. It was like a little gangster with some sunglasses and a hat on and said, you know, if you, show this to anybody, we'll find you and kill you. And I sat there, I opened it, and I, I was saying, part for you is Jules. I read it, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just flipped it back over, and I read it again immediately. I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. He wanted me to look at the two robed characters. He said, there are two guys that wear robes. Look at those roles, and we'll, we'll talk about it. And I think ultimately he wanted me to play Lance because Directing that needle scene was probably much more intense than uh, directing the scene that he was in with Harvey Cattell, I think. They called me one day and said they wanted me to come in because they wanted to hear what Jewel sounded like. And I was like, all right, sure. So I went in and, you know, we sat there and I read with Lawrence again and somebody else in the room. And then they started to have auditions, I guess, after that. And like I said, I was in New York doing Fresh. Uh, and I get a phone call from my manager saying, and, well, apparently they read some guy who asked to read your part when they were auditioning for something else, and they were so blown away by him, they're thinking about, you know, giving him the part now. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? It's like, nobody told me when I went in to read I was auditioning. They told me the part was mine when they sent me the script. So it was one of those Hollywood lessons that you always have to do the things that you do. Don't take for granted that just because somebody said it's yours, it's going to be yours because they changed their mind. Just 
the wind blows one way and blows another way on another day. So they brought the other guy in. They brought me in. It's Lawrence Quentin and Paul somebody. They're all going, hey, 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 and they get ready to introduce him. He says, oh, you don't have to introduce me to this man. I love your work, Mr. Fishburne. And I was like, for real? He didn't. <laughs> so now I'm like really pissed off. But we get in the room, we start to do the reading, and we're like rocking through it. And the reader, <laughs> I don't know who this guy was they hired as the reader, but he's reading with me, and I'm like going through this thing, and I'm like boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden, dude's not reading anymore. He's like just staring at me like, and I'm like, dude, this is an audition. And he's like, oh, I was just so mesmerized. So he was lost. I'm like, you can blow the job for me. But we continue, and um, we end up with the diner scene. We do the diner scene, blah, 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 and it's done. And um, I get on a plane, go back to New York, thoroughly pissed off to finish fresh, and then Lawrence comes back. And when he gets back that day, he tells me, look, don't worry, everything's cool. Role is still yours, but let me tell you, we never knew how this movie ended until you did the last diner scene, until you did that last monologue, and that's what like cemented the job for you. Like when you did that, because the room was like totally silent, you could hear a pin drop in the room, and he was like, "Now we know what happens at the end of the movie." So, thanks. The truth is, you're the weak, and I am the tyranny evil men but I'm trying Ringo I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd everybody wanted the role Daniel Day Lewis wanted it uh, and he was super he just won an Academy Award he was super hot and the kind of guy they wanted in the part you know uh, I think um, there's about a half a dozen really hot guys artistically that wanted the role. And um, Quentin said, you know, I'm going to go back and repair this guy and put him in a role that he deserves to be in. And I'm going to fight for it. And nobody ever did that to, for me, you know. And that's why my memory of his love and depth of admiration is my favorite part of my memories of Pulp Fiction because I... I've never, it's more like what your mother or father would do for you. And I didn't even know if I was gonna live up to his expectations, but there's something interesting that happens when someone believes in you that much. You suddenly, your best self comes out, your best abilities, your best, your need to make them correct in their decision and their choosing you comes to be. And you give your, the best you can give. And that's what I did, I just said, I'm not going to let this boy down. It's typical kind of Quentin casting as well, is to go for somebody, a, a, you know, an iconic figure like that and, and just put him in something very, very different. In fact, his career was doing famously. He was doing the Look Who's Talking movies and all that. They were huge, absolutely massive, those films. And he was, he was doing great. But this took it to somewhere else. I mean, people just hadn't seen him that way. And that was a lot of fun for him, I think. I remember him saying something along the lines of, oh, it's great to finally be acting again. Something like, something like that, when we were sitting down and rehearsing. He was having such a good time. The script itself weighed about 14 pounds. It was, <laughs> I, I wish I, I have it somewhere at home. It, it, it was 230 pages or something. It was a novel. And before I read it, I said, wow, you gotta cut this down, man. It's really long. And he said, no, no, uh, Preston Sturges or some, some great writer, director, you just, you just write everything, and then you, it goes like this. You'll never know. It's and and he was right. There are pages like Chris Walken's thing. <laughs> must be three or four pages of solid dialogue. This was your great grandfather's war watch, and he wore it every day. He was in that war. And you look at that and you go, "Ooh, I wonder how this is going to work." It's clearly touched by genius, but this is four pages of a guy talking, and that is it's. Ballsley to write like that. He had me up in his room in the, at the hotel, drunkenly reading me every scene of Pulp Fiction. And he'd had it, because he writes, thing, he hand writes everything, you know? I don't know if he still does, but he used to then. And so he just, he's go, oh, wait a minute, this is a good bit. And just, 
champagne. And, we were, and he just did the whole movie, pretty much the whole movie. Brilliant, to say the least. It was the best writing I'd seen uh, maybe ever, you know, as far as like a depth style and, and verbiage. I mean, it was just amazing. Uh, but I had problems with it. You know, I, I didn't know what his vision was of this, and I didn't know what to do with blowing up a guy, head off, blowing a guy's head off and having it land on you in a Christmas tree fashion. And how do I play that? You know, how do I do that? You know, how do I shoot up heroin and when I'm, I'm such a, by nature, anti, not anti, but just, I don't support drug usage, you know? So how do you play this? And, and I, there's so many questions that I thought I've got to have answered. So I had a meeting with him and he exposed his vision and it was such a high level of a, a vision uh, that I started to see, okay, we're, we're playing ball here with, with someone who has um, almost an altruistic perspective on this whole thing. And this is not a violence for violence sake or gratuitous uh, movie, that this is actually a man with a plan. Quentin realizes that hit men don't just talk about the job. You know, I mean, I, I, I think that was the thought prior to that, that when hitmen are on the way to the job, they're busy cleaning their gun, making sure, you know, you always see people checking their guns and counting their bullets, spinning the cylinders on their guns, you know, sharpening their knives or doing whatever, talking about how much they hate the person they're going to kill or why the boss wants them killed. A piece of genius happening here, you know. And uh, I took the ride with the audience that night, and my dad, who was 83, he was floored by it, captivated by it. Thought it was the best thing he'd ever seen. When they announced, you know, the Palm Door and Quentin wins, uh, you know, people are like, ah, oh, there's a standing ovation again, standing ovation again. And then by the time everybody quiets down, somebody in the, in the top yells something about, it's a piece of shit! And he goes, oh, fuck you! <laughs> and we uh, go back to the hotel. And Bruce came in, went to his room, got his boom box, plugged it in downstairs, Paid the bartender some money to keep the bar open all night, and we just turned the lobby of that hotel into a disco. It was great. <laughs> Once we won the Palm Door, the word was out throughout the world that, uh-oh, watch this movie. Then we got booked in the New York Film Festival. We were all up there in the balcony, and I, I hadn't seen it yet. And I don't think many people had. I can't speak for them, though. And so it was, it was gorgeous, a gorgeous ride. When it got to the, the sh adrenaline shot scene, somebody started screaming in the audience, and they, they stopped the film and brought up the lights, and somebody was having a heart attack. It was the stabbing in the heart of the needle, then bam, the moans and groans, the woman saying stop the movie and I swear to you the, the the voice of the woman sounded exactly like my sister Margaret and so I said oh my god my father has had a heart attack right after the scene of Uma getting it in the heart and I can't believe this I'm gonna lose my father in the middle of this movie at, at this big night and that's when, um, you know, the real legends of Pulp Fiction star is like, this woman has a heart attack in the audience when Uma Thurman gets stabbed in the chest with the adrenaline needle. It's like, she had, um, what, um, um, well, she was diabetic. She, had, she went into anaphylactic shock or some shit and needed some, needed some candy. <laughs> but, you know, it was like one of those things that people go, oh, I gotta see this movie. Oh, my God, because... It was a big, you know, it was a big deal that somebody passed out in the middle of the movie, in the middle of that needle scene. If Saturday Night Fever was the movie of the 70s, of course, Pulp Fiction was the, the movie of the 90s. But it's so much more than that. It, 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 it changed filmmaking forever. What immediately happened, and, and, in, a, in, a, and, in, and in a good way, 
Um, it inspired a bunch of directors to go out and make films. He actually created, you know, not to mention the whole, you know, time frame and the way you put a film together or the way a film can work. Because I, mean, I remember my mom saying, why didn't they put the movie together right? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, it was jumping all over the place, back and forth. You were dead, you were alive, and you were back, you're here. I'm like, no, that's how the movie works. It's just a convention. Just like, everybody can't watch it. Apparently you can. It's okay. But, um, yeah, it, uh, it uh, created a whole new school of people um, that made it okay to just do a film the way you want to do it. You know, so what do people think is dyslexia? People come up to me, it's one of their favorite favorites, Pulp Fiction. Absolutely. All over the world. It's, they love it. You see, that's the thing with Quentin. He doesn't do things arbitrarily. It has real thought, depth, and, and decision to him. And, and he sits with it for a long period. It's not like uh, fleeting or capricious decisions. These are well thought out decisions. You know, I was a 20 year decision. And then the gift he gave me and giving me my career back at a high level. I mean, the best directors asked me to do their movies and I get offered the best scripts and I'm still riding off of it. Uh, but that's all because of his, you know, giving me my, my, my life back as an artist. There's a lot of people who, you know, are one hit wonder directors and then disappear, but he just keeps growing, changing, exploring. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the next 20 years. His personality is, within his films, which is what makes him so compelling to me. He's one of the two or three filmmakers that I will go and see everything he does, as soon as I can. Yeah, I love him. I love him. I love his big heart. And he opens up different doors of perception, which I think is a great gift to give to people. He's always been a great filmmaker, even in his head. When he was sitting in that video store watching movies, he was becoming a really great filmmaker. Uh, and I think that's what makes him a great filmmaker because he loves film. He loves storytelling. Um, there aren't a lot of people who do this job who have the kind of uh, genuine adoration for what the cinema is or what cinematic history is or what made us fall in love with movies in the first place. And he's one of those people uh, that gives his soul to those particular things when he goes to work. And that's the biggest thing about him that I appreciate.